Good morning. We are just uh, just about ready to get underway, so if you want to come in from the narthex and join us, we'd love to have you in here. <clears throat> I've got a couple of things that I want to um, bring to your attention this morning, then Matt's got some announcements uh, that need to be made. Uh, and the first thing I want to say to you this morning is, is my heart is overwhelmed with rejoicing today. Um, there have been so many wonderful, good things that have happened this last week. Uh, it's just amazing. So last Tuesday night, our session met, and uh, session uh, has been uh, praying and waiting and uh, uh, looking forward to that uh, evening. And uh, we, uh, by motion of the session, have called Matt Matuya as the assistant pastor for church planting here at New Hope Presbyterian Church. One of the elders tried to cut his pay, uh, but other than that, it was, no. In all seriousness, we rejoice. Matt has accepted the call, and uh, he, will, he will begin his work toward ordination uh, over the next uh, several months. Ordination is not an easy uh, ordeal, and uh, uh, we're, you may recall David's process for ordination, and uh, he, it took him a little while to uh, get it done. Matt is hoping, by God's grace, to get it done uh, by the November uh, Presbytery meeting, and uh, we are going to support that and encourage that and uh, try to help him uh, move along in that direction. But we are just rejoicing in that. And then Friday... Oh, well, we went to Matt's graduation at uh, RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary, and so we would just rejoice with Matt and, and thank God for the good thing that uh, he's doing here. And you know what that means? That means that we are on track for daughtering another church here in Lake County. And that's what I want you to pray about. I want you to begin to really and truly pray about daughtering a second congregation here in Lake County that is a gospel-centered church that loves Jesus Christ, that loves the Word, and that will be a replicating body of believers because that's what we're called to be and do. And so would you join us in that prayer and uh, would you prayerfully consider how you can participate with us in that? Okay. That's, those are two great things. Now, we have some other good things that have happened as well this week, and we'll get to more of those, but the yellow card is in your bulletin, and I hope it'll be in the offering plate in a little while. 
Uh, if you're here this morning, would you fill out the yellow card? Would you drop it in the offering plate? There's a place for prayer requests. There's a place for uh, vital statistics, for your uh, personal information. And we would love to have that so that we can uh, be in touch with you, so that you can get our newsletters, so that we can communicate back and forth and that kind of thing. But more than that, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. And so uh, if we can rejoice with you uh, in prayer, let us know. If we can lift you before the throne of grace, let us know. Uh, we really do want to do that. Matt, you've probably got some other announcements, so I'm going to get out of the way. Probably do that one. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll just start with that one. Um, we have the uh, Life's Choices baby bottle campaign going on through May and June. Um, there are some empty baby bottles out here in the Narthex. Who you guys. One? Yeah. You can fill them up, um, bring them back in, and we will make sure those get um, to the proper place. Uh, this helps to support their ministry each and every year. Um, a few other announcements. Um, again, just as a reminder, all of these are in our newsletter that goes out, so you can keep, keep up with everything. If you're not receiving the newsletter, please email us here at the church office, and we'll make sure you get on that list. Um, but the, the next announcements are these. Um, first, uh, as we have said, the Music and Arts Camp registration is filled, um, but we are still in need of some volunteers. And so if you would like to be a part of that volunteer team, um, you can sign up out in the Narthex. There should be a sheet of paper out there. You don't have to be musically or artistically talented. Um, you just have to be willing to love children and serve and the, um, the team will put you to work. Um, you can see Lindsay Matulia and ask her what specifically she needs. She did mention um, there's in their need of a, of a decorating team for the Narthex and for some of the different classroom doors. So if you feel like you, you might have that um, gift or talent, you can see her for that. Also, if you are signed up to be a volunteer, please, um, to today when you leave in the Narthex, uh, you'll see a list with your name on it. Just write down your t-shirt size for the Music and Arts Camp so they can get those t-shirts ordered for you guys. Um, lastly, with the Music and Art Camp, um, they will be sending out in the future a snack list. So even if you can't be here and volunteer, you, you could help out by, by purchasing the snacks that they need for that week. So they will be sending out a list via email, and then you can just you know, fill a spot on that list as well. Um, a couple other reminders, we will be hosting uh, two marriage small groups, one in June and one in July. Um, those signups are in the Narthex. Uh, it's a Paul David Tripp marriage uh, uh, study. Uh, one will be on Monday nights in June with, um, at the Cook's house with DC and Kathy Cook. The other one will be in July with the Weary family. Um, both, both Pete and PJ and Becky Sue and Lisa um, will all be a part of that. Um, so if you'd like to be a part of that, please sign up in the Narthex. Um, also, tonight is the last night of the membership class. So if you are a part of that, uh, please don't forget to, to be there at the Burgett's home this evening. And then lastly, as a reminder, next Sunday night will be the hymn sing here, the last Sunday of the month, um, Sunday night at, is it six or seven? Six o'clock here at the church, hymn sing next Sunday. Thank you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Arise, shine, for the risen sun. Lift your eyes, we are His radiant bride. Arise, O church.
call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 84, um, verses 10 through 12. In the very first line, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. When we gather together as the people of God, we are experiencing this in a very small way. We're experiencing a foretaste of this reality that we will one day experience in its fullness when we stand before God together. And so God this morning mercifully and graciously invites us into his presence, that we would praise and glorify his name. So if you would, please join us in standing for our call to worship this morning as our God and Father invites us into his presence. Where? I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Please pray with me. O Lord our God, you truly are our sun and our shield, the giver of life and our protector. We cry out to you this morning as your people in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Savior. He is the eternal Word who became flesh and who dwelt among us. We pray this morning, O Lord, that you would remember your gracious promises to us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will always be with us. Grant us this morning, O Lord, by your Spirit, to experience the joy of your presence and the pleasures at your right hand. For a day in your courts is truly a better than a thousand elsewhere. Lord, we ask this morning that you would transform us by your spirit, that we may be a people who rejoice in you and glorify you in all of life. For you are worthy of all glory, honor, and power, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you would please be seated. Let me ask the Weary family to come up and join us this morning. <clears throat> the Wearies uh, met with a session last Tuesday evening as well. We had a big meeting Tuesday night. Come all the way up. <clears throat> and Tuesday evening we uh, interviewed uh, uh, Peter and Lisa, uh, we actually interviewed Peter uh, via uh, Zoom, and uh, Peter, I meant to tell you that uh, we're going to have to do something this morning. Oh, I'm I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) We interviewed the Wearies and uh, had a great opportunity just to hear how the grace of God has been at work in their family for generations. And uh, we uh, uh, received Peter and Lisa, we received PJ, Becky, Sue, and Soren, and um, Finn uh, is coming as covenant child this morning, or wait, I got it backwards. Finn is, was received, and Soren is coming as covenant child this morning, uh, and uh, we just are rejoicing uh, in their uh, being a part of us. I'm going to ask them to respond to the uh, questions from the Book of Church order, and uh, respond in such a way that we can hear you all the way to the back. Okay? I think you can do it, Peter. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, 
justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except for his sovereign mercy. Do you? Yes. yes. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Do you? Yes. Do you resolve and promise and humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ? Do you? Yes. Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? Yes. yes. And last, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to strive for its purity and peace? Yes. yes. It is wonderful to be able to, on behalf of the session and represent the session, to receive you guys. Uh, we are thankful for the work of grace that Christ has done in your hearts individually and for the way God honors the covenant family. We have a beautiful illustration of that this morning. And uh, as a special uh, marker today, uh, we have uh, uh, arranged to uh, give this uh, uh, little uh, uh, textbook, this little uh, book to uh, Finn this morning. And uh, it's called uh, the, King's, the Good King's Feast, and it's an invitation to the Lord's Table. Uh, he gave a great testimony of his faith in Jesus Christ, and uh, he will be able to participate in communion uh, for the first time uh, this next time we serve communion, which will be next two weeks, two weeks away. So uh, we're looking forward to that. So, Finn, thank you. Can I shake your hand? Good job. Good job. I'm going to... I'm going to ask Matt to pray for the uh, weary family, and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, gracious God and Father, we give you thanks and we rejoice um, for the weary family. We thank you that you have brought them here to New Hope. Um, Lord, we thank you for the gifts and talents that you have given them uh, to be able to serve the body of Christ here. And we pray for this family, uh, God, that you would just continue the wonderful um, and the good work that you have begun in their hearts and lives. Um, we are so grateful and thankful to be able to be a part of their lives. Um, we pray all this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Welcome. Welcome. Congratulations. Welcome. <laughs> Let's continue our worship this morning as we would join together and stand and sing. Now thank we all our God. Indeed. We have reason to thank our God. Let's stand together.
as we come to the portion of our service, our, of our service, excuse me, where we're going to give back to the Lord our tithes and our offerings, I just wanted to share a verse that I read this week and a couple of thoughts. Um, this is from the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and this is where the author of the book um, just gives uh, God's people a few exhortations after presenting Christ as the, the supreme and great high priest. And this is what it says here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, I think um, regardless of whether we have a lot of money or a little bit of money, I think we all struggle with, with what is um, said in this verse, this struggling with this love of money and real contentment in our lives and in our hearts. And I think um, one thing that the giving of our tithes and offerings offers us is a chance to, um, to grow in our contentment with thanksgiving. I think the more that we can give thanks, uh, even for the little that the Lord has given us, the more we can learn to be content um, with what he truly has given us. So this morning, I invite you to give thanks as you give back to the Lord. as we stand and sing together, O Church, Arise. Christ will have 
before the Lord uh, in a time of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, uh, we as your people bow before you humbly this morning. Lord, we praise your great name. Lord, we confess that you indeed are, are a holy, righteous God. God, we confess also that you indeed are a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We worship your name this morning, O Lord. And as your people, we also come before you this morning humbly confessing our sin. Lord, we confess before you this morning that so often, in light of your holiness, we take our sin so lightly. Lord, we confess this morning that so often we lose sight of the reality of our sin, of the weightiness of sin, of the reality of sin and its, and its consequences. Lord, we lose sight of the reality of the good news of the gospel. Lord, as we take our sin lightly, um, we also diminish the gloriousness of your grace. Lord, we diminish the work of Christ on the cross for our behalf. 
And so this morning we ask that you would indeed uh, awaken our hearts, that you would give us eyes to see the, the greatness of the gospel, that we would rejoice in the truth that at one time we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but um, because of your great love for us, you have made us alive together with Christ, that um, being united to Christ by faith, we are seated with him in the heavenly places, and that is something for us to rejoice in this morning. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for those truths. We give you thanks that um, with you there is indeed forgiveness. Lord, we give you thanks that you are our good and loving Father, that you have provided for our every need, Lord, that you um, continue to reveal yourself as being faithful, a faithful God, faithful to us. Lord, um, we thank you that in your goodness towards us, you allow us to be a part of the work of your kingdom. Lord, you allow us to um, be a part of your uh, ministry. You allow us to be a part of each other's lives. You allow us to um, be involved in praying for one another and seeing the fruits of our prayers um, come to fruition. Lord, we praise you for that this morning. Lord, we thank you also that we can bring our many prayer requests before you. And so this morning, Lord, we lift up our many missions partners to you. Um, but especially this morning, we pray for Don Cobb and, and his wife, Claire Lise, this morning. Uh, who are in France, and we pray uh, for them um, that they are struggling right now in their ministry. Their, their board of the school where they are serving is, um, is playing with the possibility of perhaps closing the doors. And so, Lord, we pray that um, you would be with Don and Claire Lise and their sons. Lord, we pray that you indeed would um, uh, see fit to continue their work of ministry there, that you would see fit to uh, keep these, uh, this school open, the doors of this school open. Lord, we ask that you would provide for the needs of the school. We ask that you would provide for Don and Claire Lease. Um, we ask that you would continue to um, grant them great joy in their ministry there in France. Um, we also pray uh, along with them for their sons that you, Lord, would continue to use them for the work of your kingdom there in Europe. Lord, this morning we also lift up the many churches in our presbytery, but Lord, especially we pray for Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Titusville and Pastor Gary Ginn. Lord, we pray um, that you would be with Gary this morning as he preaches the gospel. We pray that through the preaching of your word, that you indeed would transform the hearts of your people there in Titusville, that they may be a light um, in the midst of, of the darkness that surrounds them there. Lord, also this morning, we just continue to lift up um, not just Holy Trinity Church in Kyrgyzstan, but we lift up all of our brothers and sisters there in Ukraine um, as they are continuing to struggle um, through this time of, of war and conflict there in Ukraine. Lord, we pray for um, the physical and spiritual safety of our brothers and sisters there in Ukraine. Um, Lord, we pray for them as they are living, truly living moment by moment. They have no idea what uh, even the next five minutes could bring them. And so, Lord, um, we pray that you would increase their faith. Lord, um, in a small way, um, we, we do uh, rejoice that you are really and truly in a real way at work in their lives. And we pray that they would see that. Lord, we pray that through this time of conflict and and challenge and and through this time of the unknown that they would um, just grow in their knowledge of who you are as the God of all creation as the sovereign ruler as the faithful and loving God that you would show yourself faithful to them lastly this morning Lord we lift up um, just our own church and the many needs that we have here in our own community Lord this morning we pray uh, looking forward to the music and arts camp to um, the middle school and high school camps this summer, we pray uh, for our children and our youth that these camps uh, would, would really and truly um, be a time of, of spiritual growth and transformation for our children and our youth. Lord, we pray that um, they would have ears to hear clearly uh, the truths of the gospel through, um, through music and art and through 
their travels and being away um, with the middle schoolers and high schoolers. Lord, we pray that um, these volunteers and these leaders that are around them, um, that you would work through their lives and through their words to minister to our students. Lord, we also pray for these many volunteers that, that these camps would be a time of spiritual growth and transformation for them as well as they uh, use their gifts and talents to serve. Lord, we pray that the volunteers would find great joy in serving you through their efforts here. Lord, also this morning, uh, we pray for the many in our congregation and even extended families of our congregation that are suffering this morning, whether that be physically um, recovering from surgery or struggling through cancer, or Lord, we pray also for those who are struggling um, mentally and emotionally. Lord, uh, we know that the only uh, true answer to all of these struggles is the hope of the second coming of Christ our Savior when you will make all things new. And so, Lord, now we pray that in the midst of these, these uh, physical and mental and emotional ailments that um, that hope would become more and more real uh, to your people right here at New Hope, to those struggling and suffering. We do pray for healing um, physically and mentally and emotionally. We pray that uh, the gospel, that Christ would dwell richly in the, in the hearts of those who are struggling. Uh, Lord, lastly, um, we also just continue to um, bring uh, the hope of a church plant before you. Um, we pray, God, that you would guide our steps. God, that through um, our efforts as New Hope, as the body of Christ here, that um, many uh, unbelievers would come to faith, um, that the gospel would spread throughout Lake County, even more so than it has already. Lord, we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, children, you are dismissed for Children's Church. Um, Rob, if you could meet them in the back and then I will be right back there. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me ask you to turn with me in the scriptures to Acts chapter 20 this morning. Acts chapter 20 is where we're going to pick up uh, with the text today. You all know that uh, I was away a couple of weeks ago uh, to South Africa. I actually got an extra week uh, unplanned for uh, there uh, in the providence of God. It was uh, uh, an amazing, uh, it was an amazing two weeks, actually. Uh, the whole thing was uh, incredible. Uh, had the, the opportunity to do something that I have dreamed for decades uh, about doing and hope to do. And, and it was awesome in the fullest meaning of the word. I, I can't tell you. I've got, I've got lots of pictures, and anytime, just catch me. I'll pull my phone out, and uh, we can spend some time. Uh, I actually did a little uh, Shutterfly book of uh, some of the pictures out of my uh, phone and that kind of thing. You can't believe the vistas that we saw, the, the beauty of creation we found ourselves immersed in, the, the sunsets, the sunrises, the, the rainbows, the sunlit clouds, the, the, just the golden skies at night. Well, one of the amazing, startling things to me was we were in a, uh, w uh, hunting in a prairie in a, in a, in a plateau uh, that was um, uh, full of grass, you know, grass about that deep and uh, crunchy uh, at uh, uh, one point, but uh, right after the rains, little succulent flowers began to bloom, and then we began to sneeze. But anyway, uh, that, that's, you know, that's a whole other thing. It was like Around every bend, there was a new something, you know, there was a, there was a proliferation of animals. Uh, um, we, we, would, we would top a ridge and there would be something beautiful to behold and, and something un, unexpected or whatever. Or we slipped through a drain, uh, a drainage, and uh, uh, there are water buffalo tracks. And you're thinking to yourself, am I really a sane man? Uh, walking down the same track that uh, water buffalo walk down or the other tracks that are there. Everywhere we looked, and Brian will agree, I think, everywhere we looked, all creation screamed God's glory. I mean, everywhere we turn, uh, even in the mud as we managed to stick our vehicle or slide through uh, the water and the mud and that kind of thing, the Creator's Glory was seen in a praiseworthy way. 
And you know, you got to take your time when you're walking through terrain like that to, to look up if you're going to enjoy it in the fullest. And it's, it would be easy to keep your eyes focused on the ground in front of you because there are rocks, because there, there are holes, there are places where the warthogs have uh, tilled the soil. Uh, there, there are places to trip and fall and that kind of thing. Uh, but you'll miss something if you don't look up, if you don't focus your eyes a little higher. Um, you'll miss the movement of an animal across the plain or miss uh, the glory of the clouds or the sky or or just the creation around you. I was just reflecting on that this week and thinking about that as I was studying, actually, and probably, you know how it is, daydreaming a little bit as I was uh, reading the scriptures and that kind of thing, and then the analogy kind of hit me. It's really easy when you uh, uh, are walking through a passage of scripture to miss the beauties of of what it is teaching, uh, especially, I think, in some parts of the book of Acts. Uh, because the Acts narrative, uh, over and over again, gives you a travel log in many ways. It tells you Paul went from here to there, and he went with these people, and he did these things, and that kind of thing. And you kind of get caught up in the, the journey, and you miss uh, the beauty of what's going on here. I think it's vulnerable to our neglect because those moments in the book of Acts are sandwiched between the big elements, you know, the big pretty things, the, the big beautiful things that catch your eye and that catch your attention and that hold your thoughts. And so this morning, lest we miss the jewels that lie in the quiet part of Scripture, I want to focus our attention on Acts chapter 20 and I want to spend some time on those first six verses this morning before we get to the thing that everybody knows about. Eutychus fell asleep in church and fell out of the window, okay? That's the big picture. That's the big thing that everybody spends all the time on, and we miss the thing that leads up to that. And so I want you to get both parts of what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today. Right here under our noses, right here in this passage that we kind of buzz through to get to Eutychus being raised from the dead, we have the cameos of church life that present a picture for us of what a vibrant, gospel-centered church ought to look like. Together, they tell us what every church ought to be that's worth her master's salt. And so this morning, let's give careful attention to Acts chapter 20. I want to read all the way down through verse 16 of our text, just two major sections here uh, in, the sec in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. This is the inerrant, inspired, and infallible word of God, and it is for us, and it's for today. After the uproar ceased, that's the riot in the city of Ephesus, after the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. And when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return to, through Macedonia. Sopater, the uh, Berean son of Phyrus, uh, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, uh, and the uh, Asians, Tychus and Trophimus. These went on ahead, but were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days." On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to part, depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. 
and they took the youth away alive and were not a little uh, comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asus, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Asus, he took, uh, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos, and the day after we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Let me pray. Father God, I ask you this morning to take this, your word, and by your Spirit's work of grace through it, and in our hearts to help us to see Jesus, to help us to see the beauty of the gospel, to help us to see how the gospel forms churches that are vital and that love you and love your word. Oh, Father, would you be our teacher? Would you allow us this morning to see the beauty that is all around us in this text? I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So what we have here is a description of a gospel-centered church. And, and, and we basically, I've got four points in my outline this morning. I'll give them to you one at a time on the uh, screen behind me. But what you see here in the first few verses is a heartfelt love. And then you see a supportive fellowship. And then you see lively worship. And then you see the message and experience of a new life in Jesus Christ. So that's where we're headed this morning. After the riot that has taken place uh, in, in Ephesus, we saw that last Sunday, Paul evidented, uh, evidently concluded that it was the better part of, of ministerial uh, valor uh, to leave, okay? It was a good time for him to go, is what he said. He, he encouraged them, uh, he, he left the Ephesian Christians, and he said, farewell, and he sets out for Macedonia. Now, it's really easy to get caught up in the details here. But think about that for just a minute. Paul has been in Ephesus for better than two years now at this point. He's been ministering to the flock there. He's been loving them. He's been discipling them. He has been equipping them and encouraging them. And he's leaving. He says goodbye. Many a congregation has had to suffer the trauma of, a, of, of the moving of their pastor, hasn't it? Over and over again, since these days, churches have had to struggle with that. The pastor going on to another sphere of, of uh, service over the centuries. You know, the, the standing joke around here used to be that uh, when the pastor uh, got ready to uh, leave New Hope, that he would pull one of the stools out of the uh, uh, music pit over here and sit down uh, beside the pulpit and uh, talk to the congregation about his next call. I thought about getting a stool out just for grins. I'm not going anywhere. You're not, I'm not, we're not talking about me yet. Okay. So um, y'all are stuck with me. I'm sorry. Um, but so many congregations have, and, and some of y'all are saying, golly, that guy's still going to be here. Anyway, um, so many, so many, <laughs> thank you. I needed that today. Um, so many congregations have the thought, what's going to happen? How, how are we going to go ahead? Who's going to fill Paul's shoes? What are we going to do now? Many thoughts, fears course through their minds. But that's just a, a tragic reality of, of ministry and, and of life in this world. Now today it's not as bad as it used to be, right? Because we still remain in contact with one another. I mean, when Paul left Ephesus, what does he do? He sails away. They think that in this life they may never see him again. Okay, we have Facebook, we have uh, Zoom calls, we have email and, and cell phones. We can be in touch with anybody all around the world at any point. But it's still hard. I was reflecting on this text and I was praying about Ukraine and praying for Sergei uh, Kukushkin and, and praying for uh, the situation at Holy Trinity in Kyrgyzstan. And I went, oh, that is exactly what Holy Trinity in Kyrgyzstan is feeling right now about Sergei being here in the States. 
That is the perfect illustration of what these saints at Ephesus are feeling about Paul's departure. They don't know. Matthew Henry said this, and it's so true, and, and you know it's especially true with the death of a loved one, but it's also true of a long-distance move. Matthew Henry said, Loving friends know not how well they love one another till they come to part. And then it appears how near they lay to one another's hearts. Boy, that's the truth. Have you felt that? Do you know that? That's what the church at Ephesus was feeling about Paul's departure. And so consequently, they had a long night together. A long night worshiping and teaching and encouraging. There's no hint here that they're not willing to let him go, that they're unwilling or something. They don't cling to him as their exclusive possession. Uh, they knew that Paul was an apostle. They knew that Paul was called to take the gospel to other places, not just the province of Asia, Asia but to the nations of the world. I think that uh, uh, he left with them with their blessing. I'm pretty sure that they were encouraged. They loved Christ. They loved Paul with an open heart and with an open hand. And they knew that he was being obedient to his sovereign Lord. That's the first thing that jumped off the page of the text for me this week. What a beautiful picture of their love for him. Well, there's a supportive fellowship that's here, too, and, and you can see that in verses 2 to 6. Uh, this travelogue kind of starts in verse 2. Uh, Paul speaks many words of encouragement to the people, and, and then he moves on to Greece where he stays for three months, and, and then he's forced to move because of a threat of persecution. There's nothing new under the sun for the Apostle Paul here. This has happened over and over and over again. Uh, verses 2 to 3 talk about the persecution. Um, but did you know what God did during this time in Paul's life? Do you know how God used Paul, even though he's on the move, even though he is still uh, struggling with those things? This is the time when Paul's letter writing kind of hit its zenith, if you will. This is the time when, when, when scholars and historians figured out that after his arrival in Macedonia, he wrote the book of 2 Corinthians, okay? No small feat. If you look at the book of 2 Corinthians, and then once he was in Greece from Corinth, uh, he penned his letter to the Romans. Wow. Amazing. And it was also a fruitful time for evangelism. Uh, Paul was able to say that he had fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to uh, Ilicrum. I cannot ever say that name. Anyway, that's, in the, that's uh, from modern Israel to Croatia. How's that? That's easier for me to say. Um, that's a huge a huge achievement. He has covered incredible geography, sharing the gospel. And you know, I was thinking about that too. And I thought, you know, you look at the Apostle Paul, you look at the, the church planting uh, efforts that he engaged in, you look at the way he did what he did, and it was the Holy Spirit at work, there's no doubt about it. But Paul had a team around him who were engaged with him, who, who helped him along all along the way. Titus was with him in Macedonia uh, and for part of the way back to Syria. Um, and he was accompanied by a team of no less than seven men. You see that? That's a beautiful thing that, that Paul is talking about here in these next few verses. So, so let me just take a second to give you the catalog. I've got the list of uh, uh, Paul's uh, ministry team there uh, on one of the slides for you. Um, so first of all, it's an interesting group of guys. Paul leaves for Philippi. He's sailing over to Troas, or to Troy, modern-day Troy, um, and uh, they wait for him to catch up with them a little later, okay? Uh, and Sopater. Uh, is probably the, the Sosphater uh, of Romans 16, 21. It's probably the same guy. He was one of the Bereans, okay? He was one of the fellows who, who Luke records as being more noble in character uh, and talks about one who studied the Scriptures to see if what Paul was teaching uh, was true. Then there's, then there's uh, Aristarchus. Uh, Aristarchus was the one who was, who was arrested in the Ephesian uh, riot that has just taken place uh, in the chapter before. Uh, he's also known as Paul's fellow prisoner uh, in uh, um, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Then there's Secundus. 
Uh, Secundus, we don't really know anything about Secundus other than his name, and he's listed here. Um, from Galatia comes Gaius of Derby and Timothy of Lystra. Uh, later, uh, they were both recipients of uh, the letters, and um, uh, they bear Timothy's name. Um, and uh, then from the province of Asia comes Tychus. Uh, he's referred to as a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant of the Lord. Uh, and Trophimius, uh, the disciple who's later noted as being, and you know, this would be my luck. I would be recorded in Scripture as the one who was sick in Miletus, you know. That's all we know about him. That's, you know, that would be me. Uh, that's all good. These guys were Paul's men. They were his ministry team. They were the guys that walked beside him as he went church planting. You see, Paul didn't do this on his own. It wasn't just a one-man job. And I think there's a principle there for us as we think about Matt launching. I think there's a principle for church planting as a whole that ought to impact everything that we do as a denomination. For these men, Paul's company on the long miles to Jerusalem was like being in a school of the prophets. I mean, they were doing their internships with him. They're on-the-job on the training for their future ministries. It was real gospel fellowship. It was more than just camaraderie. It was more than just strong uh, brotherly love for one another. They were iron sharpening iron. They were growing together in grace. One of the greatest, deepest joys that I have as serving as your pastor here is the fact that I am able to be involved in and engaged in those kinds of relationships right here. I, I will tell you, that is one of the things that floats my boat more than anything else. I love the fact that we are working together as a team, that David and Randall and Matt and Saul are all part of the, 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 the ministry team here, that we've got, we've got elders and deacons who are part of the team, and that we are working together, and that we are iron sharpening iron, that we are uh, working together toward the same goals. Every one of you who gives yourself so graciously, thank you for that. I was, as, I was, as I was worshiping a little while ago, I was thinking to myself about the worship team. You know, these folks who lead us in worship every Sunday, they have taken time out of their schedules and they have given that to the Lord to give back to you. That's a great sacrifice. Those who teach in children's church, they are sacrificing of themselves. When we have teaching on Wednesday night, when we have any gatherings, what a great body of believers. So look, there's, there's a lot here that we could talk about in this text. The basics in, basic ingredients of a healthy ministry of a church life are right here under our noses in this text. And often we just buzz right by them. Strong leadership, good teamwork, supportive fellowship of the church. They all undergirded by a clear leading of the Holy Spirit. God is leading and directing his church. I think God is doing that here. I think we are a small reflection of what the scriptures are talking about here in Acts 20. And I want to fan that to a flame. Let's, look, let's continue to look at the text here. Oh, by the way, I, I pulled a quote uh, that, that I think you really need to read and think about. It says this. It says, a church, full, or a church of spectators is not really a church at all. For the biblical model envisions the active involvement of the whole membership in the growing assimilation into the body of those who are converted to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Wow. That's the truth. Worship is not a spectator sport. The body of Christ being the church of Jesus Christ is not a spectator sport. It is something that we are all engaged in. Well, let's talk about something else. Look at verse 7 of the text there. What there's, in verse 7, in, in the opening part of verse 7, what we see here is, is the beauty of living worship. Look at what it says. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. 
Ah, I'm going to bring it in under Paul's time limit there today, okay? <laughs> Just want to assure you that. I think there's something here in verse 7 that is so important. So we, we've looked at a heartfelt love. We've looked at a supportive fellowship. And now I want to see what really lively worship really is all about. I, I think lively worship is, is a worship that's, that's a result of the things that we've already seen. I think lively, I, when I say lively worship, I don't, mean, I don't mean wild and crazy lively. I mean worship that comes out of life, that comes out of a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Worship that is filled with life. In fact, I think there are four characteristics that ought to be the norm that ought to be regulative for every healthy church. And it comes right out of the text here. Look at verse 7. Okay, they were meeting together. They gathered together. The first principle is that Christians are to meet together for worship. That's an important idea for us post-COVID. That's something that we need to be serious about. That's not an optional extra, I don't believe. It's, 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 not a, it's not an added blessing on top of your individual devotions or on top of, of, of the uh, essential, uh, uh, ne necessary part of your spiritual life as you spend time in the Word or as you go to Bible study or as you do uh, some sort of Zoom meeting or something like that or even as you gather together as a family. I think corporate worship is a value that we cannot deny. I think it's something that, that is an elemental part of what the church is all about. In fact, I, I think that people who say they have to think about maybe going to church are actually betraying a seriously defective grasp of the nature of biblical worship. Worship is the crown jewel of what we do every week. Worship is when we as a people come together. Worship is done in the plural. It's done together. We worship the living God. Those, those for whom the Lord is, is the sun and shield, who yearn for the courts of the Lord uh, with hearts that cry out for the living God, like Psalm 84 says. Th those who, where, where genuine love for the Lord and worship where they come together in spirit and in truth, that corporate nature of worship is essential to our health as believing individuals. We need one another. Just like we need team ministry, we depend on one another. And look, that person in this congregation that rubs you the wrong way, that person that you just as soon not have to deal with today or, or you know, next... That person, you need that person as much as you need the person that you are just anxious to get together with and see. Because we are like sandpaper sometimes, rubbing against one another and taking the sharp edges off of our souls and our hearts. And we are those who are given to the task of encouraging one another and building one another up. Where there's a genuine love for the Lord and for worship, um, it, there is nothing that can hold us back. We ought to be like the psalmist. Let us go to the house of the Lord. A day in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand days anywhere else. That's why we use that for a call to worship today. Individualism, familyism, home church, stay-at-home religion, deny the covenanted. Did you hear me? Covenanted? The, 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 the covenant family and corporate experience, which is the very essence of biblical worship. It's important to be together as God's people. Even private worship derives a lot of its meaning and power from the broader covenant context and is inseparable from the life of the people of God as a whole. We do worship God in plural. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, how about those people who are, who are put into solitary confinement, the persecuted church, the, the, the church where, where Christians are being uh, persecuted and, and put aside? The persecuted saints of God cry out um, as those who are unnaturally deprived of the fellowship of the people of God. They long for it. They may be isolated, but they are not isolationists. I believe that, that the first impulse of every new Christian 
is to gather together for the public worship of God. What does Hebrews say? Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, the day of the Lord approaching, meeting together. They met together, and they met on the first day of the week, okay? The first day of the week. Something's changed here in the New Testament age, hasn't it? They've moved from Sabbath on Saturday to now Sunday worship. The church, the Troas church, met on the first day of the week. The Greek word there is mia sabaton. Uh, it means literally the first with reference to the Jewish Sabbath, okay? So it's the first day after Sabbath. That, that expression is used six other places in the New Testament uh, in reference to what we now call Sunday. Okay, I'm going to give you those references right now, and uh, if you're quick, you can write them down. Matthew 28, 1. Mark 16, 2. Luke 24, 1. John 20, 1. And then John 20, 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Okay? If you want them later on, I'll give them to you. Just text me or email me or whatever, and I'll, I'll shoot them over to you. And Revelation 10, and it, uh, 110 says this. It's, this is where, the Lord, where uh, sun, Sunday is called the Lord's Day. It becomes the Christian Sabbath. The first day of the week. They gather together on Sunday to worship the living God. One day in seven, a day of rest that was established at creation, that was canonized in the fourth commandment of the moral law, that was promised as the eternal glory that's to come. One day in seven for rest and for worship. This ought to be our highest value. And look, I, I know what you're thinking. I, you know, it, this day was moved from the first to the seventh because of the resurrection. There's no doubt about that. But I know that you're thinking, okay, well, you're the preacher, and, and you just expect everybody to be here on Sunday because, you know, that's just what preachers do. That's what you're supposed to do. No. I, I, yes, that's true about me. I do think you ought to be here, and I, but that's not the reason. I think the reason we ought to be together is because that is what God has said is best for us. And that's the bottom line. Listen, when I miss Sunday worship, it's worse than just missing a meal. It's worse, than, it's worse than just forgetting to take my medications. It's, it's worse than, than just missing something. It is like there is a hole in my week. There's something not right. It's because I think worship is that vital for us. It is God's best for his children. I think unless we're providentially hindered, we should never want to miss Never. Well, let me move on. I, I know that's one of my hobby horses, I guess, probably. What did they do? So they, they met together. They met on the first day of the week to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Another one of my hot-button topics. I love the Lord's Supper. The Troas believers assembled, like Luke says, to break bread. He's talking about the celebration of the Lord's Supper. It probably included a fellowship meal or a love feast, which the Corinthians, you remember, abused. And I think it would be cool. For, I think one of the, the glorious things that we do every year is our Monday Thursday communion service because we break bread together, and then we have the Word of God to feast on for a few minutes and then we celebrate the sacrament. I think one of the reasons that service is so special is because in some small way, it reflects kind of what was happening in Troas. The love feast that took place uh, centered around the preaching of the word. At any rate, they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And, the, and, and I think this text actually strongly suggests that we ought to celebrate the supper, the Lord's sacrament, every week. Okay, I'm just going to tell you that's where I'm coming from. Okay, our elders have seen fit to, to move us from a quarterly communion to monthly communion. But I'm still politicking for weekly communion. I'm just telling you, I think it's there. Anyway, here's the deal. 
I, I love our elders, and I, I love our session because these men are so wise and careful. They want to be sure that you are allowed the means of grace, and they want your heart to profit from the, utilizing the means of grace, and the sacrament is one of those means of grace. But they also want to be careful that we not let the sacrament become something that's mundane and that's not what it should be, that we need to have a careful observance of the Lord's Supper and it not just be rote and manual and something that we do every, every week, okay? And I understand that. And so to keep that balance, we do a liturgical once-a-month communion, okay? Still pushing for once a week, but it's okay. I think this is a healthy balance, all right? But if a church only celebrates a sacrament quarterly or twice a year, I, I think we're depriving God's people of the means of grace. These people were gathered together on the first day of the week, and they were gathered to break bread, and Paul preached to them. They were attending to the ministry of the Word, okay? Paul spoke to the people. He preached a sermon, and he preached till midnight. I love Calvin's quote here. Uh, Calvin says, Paul preached longer than usual, but he says he preached longer than usual on account of the eagerness and the attention of his audience. You know what, guys? Your attention and your participation in worship encourages my heart and encourages me to preach the word. I won't go to midnight, I know, I promise, okay? The application, I think, of this is it, it, it ought to be a corrective to the tendency in the modern church to throw everything into worship except for the preaching of the word. You know what I'm talking about. You know what happens in so many places. You know, there, things that there's no biblical warrant for. Um, we replace sermons with drama, with puppets, with magic, with liturgical dance, with who knows what. We need to be in the Word. This is where God meets us. This is where God's Holy Spirit touches us and speaks to our hearts and to our lives. There's no warrant for incorporating into God's worship anything that's a substitute for the preaching of the word by God's appointed ministers. There was no fluff in Troas, okay? Apparently, uh, not much fluff at all. And I think that ought to be true about gospel churches. Uh, and that ought to distinguish us from ear ticklers and false prophets of our time. Uh, what we see in Troas was pure, precious, presence of the Holy Spirit at work and those who were worshiping as they gave themselves to the Lord. Worship in spirit and truth. That's really what it was, I think. It was God's way. Well, now to the part of the text that everybody knows. Let's look at the next few verses here. Verses 8 to 16. The combination of Paul preaching until midnight being in an upstairs room on the third story uh, in an atmosphere that is heavy with the fumes. My goodness. I, you got any? It's going to wind down in a minute. <laughs> is it the, the switch is on? The, there you go. <laughs> Kept you awake, didn't we? <laughs> Midnight, upstairs, hot, fumes of lamps was just too much for Eutychus. Poor young man, he's perched in a window probably to just get fresh air. The room was probably packed. It was probably hot, hotter than blue blazes, third floor. He needed some fresh air and he sank into a deep sleep. You know... <sighs> Being a pastor over the years, I've watched people sleep in church before. <laughs> I'm not naming names this morning, but you know, it's, it's funny. You'll, you'll, you'll look up and you'll notice somebody's kind of nodded off and maybe they're, you know, drooling a little bit. Or, <clears throat> I've, I think I've told you the story. We had a man in our church when I was a seminary student whose name was uh, Mr. St uh, Stryger, and, and he had uh, two hearing aids uh, in his ears, and uh, he would fall asleep and his head would 
uh, lean to one side as he fell asleep, and, and his hearing aid would start to feed back, kind of like the amplifier did over there just a second ago, and I would watch the sound guy uh, try to figure out which microphone he needed to turn down because Mr. Stryger's ear thing, and, and he would wake up, and it would stop, and the sound guy would be like, I don't understand, and then five or ten minutes later, he'd go the other way. <laughs> I've seen people hit their heads on the pews. I've never had anybody fall out of a window <laughs> and from the third floor at that. I, I, the, the whole scene is really and truly a picture of our human frailty. He falls into a dead sleep. He falls out of the window, and he was picked up dead. He was dead. Paul picks him up. Paul's... Paul's Come, rushes down the steps, Paul's sermon, Paul's, Paul's teaching, Paul's the communion service, every, the worship service that they've been engaged in is interrupted in, a, in an incredible, startling way as Eutychus falls out of that window, okay? It's worse than an amplifier going off over here. It's worse than the helicopter landing in the yard and the fire trucks and the ambulances all coming to life flight somebody. It's worse than that because you've got a young man who has died. And he's on the ground. Why did it happen? Why does it happen to Eutychus, a, sm a young man, in, in, probably in the prime of his life, you know? We're tempted when something like that happens to presume that, that, that a good God shouldn't let a young man uh, fall out of the window while Paul was preaching. I mean, oh my goodness, it's the Apostle Paul who's preaching. It's a terrible thing that happens during the preaching of the Word. Why would God allow that? You know, whether it's an accident or an incurable disease, we don't like it when it happens to anyone in our day either. A promising young person dies. And so we respond like this, don't we? Why should God bring him this far only to let his potential be obliterated by an untimely death? Why would God do that? Our tendency is to push the blame on God for that kind of thing sometimes, as if he owed us a trouble-free life. There's the error in our sleeping, in our thinking. It might be a better question to ask, what biblical reason should a Christian imagine that they ought to be exempt from the common circumstances of life in a fallen world? I think about Eutychus. He's famous for falling asleep in church. It's just part of the human condition, isn't it? What's different for Christians is the promise of grace, the grace of God, which is sufficient for our, our needs day to day. Even though the Lord promises a, a measure of temporal prosperity and blessing on those who are part of the family of, of, of God, it's not the same thing as a guaranteed immunity from the realities of life in this world. I was thinking about old Eutychus. You know, may, maybe Eutychus fell asleep because he had had a hard week at work. Maybe he had been in the fields working hard day from dawn to dusk. And maybe it just caught up with him. Now, in our day, sometimes that's the case for us, isn't it? Things catch up with us. Maybe our medications, maybe, maybe our, we've had a hard week. Maybe we've not slept at night. And it catches up with us. I love to tease about falling asleep in church. And I've always said I have a gift for insomnia. Um, it's, it took you a minute to get that one, didn't it? Um, it's, just, it's just one of the realities of life. We're not exempt from the problems of life. But in our persevering through difficulties, looking to Christ as our Savior and our friend, in both our sorrows and our joys, that's where our testimony is seen. The truth remains that God has, has provided for our needs in this dying world. This world is not heaven and believers are not yet made perfect. And we're all going to struggle. There are some people who have taken this text too and this is even worse. And Calvin actually, he, he just, he, he's indignant about this suggestion that others have said. They would see Eutychus fall as a judgment for falling asleep during the sermon. You know, 
like God striking him with a, a lightning bolt. Wow. Calvin says, I'm going to quote Calvin and then we'll just leave that idea alone. He says, I see no reason why certain commentators condemn the young man's sleepiness so strongly and sharply by saying that he was punished for his lethargy and death, or with death. For what is strange about his struggling with sleep at the dead of night and finally succumbing? Nothing. The simplest explanation is the best. He fell asleep. He was tired. We don't need to ask endlessly why, why, why. You know, the answer is beyond our ability to answer. He fell asleep. He fell to his death. The proper response to Eutychus falling asleep and to Eutychus' death is to turn to faith in the Lord, okay? Not by disbelief, not by self-pity, uh, not by saying, why me, or, or thinking uh, some sort of self selfish judgmentalism, you know, uh, or self-righteous judgmentalism. Uh, he must have done something wrong. Calvin says again, he says, The Lord wished to awaken the faith of his own people, not only by the sleep, but also by the death of this young man, so that they might receive Paul's teaching more eagerly and keep it thoroughly imprinted in their minds. <laughs> He's right. Those Ephesians, or, or those Troas Christians, sorry, those Christians in Troas never forgot the night Eutychus fell out of the window. And Paul went down and revived him. No, Paul went down and the Lord revived him. Remember that. They never forgot that night. The revived Eutychus was actually a sermon in and of itself, wasn't it? It's actually a parable of an even greater life, the eternal life that saving faith in Christ brings. Eutychus revival to life, Eutychus uh, reinvigoration, uh, it, it just points to the reality of the fact that Paul was indeed an authentic apostle, that the gospel was real, that Christ really was risen from the dead. And it ought to remind us that sinners who are converted never perish. Oh, Eutychus was raised from the dead, but he was going to die again. I imagine Eutychus was a believer in Christ. I, we don't know that for certain, but I think there's every good indication that he was. Indeed, it speaks of the greater work of the Holy Spirit, the greater work of Christ in our hearts, changing lives. So what's the bottom line in the text here this morning? Eutychus revival, Eutychus uh, being brought back to life, the glory of, of the miracle of raising this young man from the death speaks about Jesus and about the work of the Holy Spirit. And then look at how the response is. Look at verse 12 of the text. The people continued to fellowship with Paul until daybreak and later went home greatly comforted. They went on with worship. They went back to worship. And they worshiped all night. Paul preached a long time. But they had a lot to do after the preaching of the word. So here it is. Love your brothers. Love your sisters in Christ. Give yourself enthusiastically to the supportive fellowship of God's people. Join together wholeheartedly in the worship of God. And walk every day in the newness of life, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Let's pray. Father, I ask you this morning to help us to take the, the truths of Acts chapter 20 to heart, to live in light of the gospel that you have given to us, that we might be the church that we have sung about this morning, to be the church that we have talked about uh, today, and that indeed we would live out the gospel before a world that is dying and without hope, and that we would point to the world, point the world to the hope of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to be a gospel-centered, church-planting, replicating body of believers, very much like the church at Troas. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Christ for the world we sing. Would you stand up with us as we close our service this morning?
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing that you may do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.